Current developments in global trade are rapidly increasing the number of countries that are part of the trade in the world economy. For this reason, except for the International Reserve Funds, countries have also taken up trade for their local currencies on their agenda. Turkey is accelerating trade with countries that are important actors of the global trade in terms of local currency brings along too many opportunities. In the coming period, we will witness more swap agreements between central banks of the countries. We will be observing in the recent future the positive effects and the advantages of trading with local currency. Dear guests, I would like to invite Mr. Rita Saidi, Minister of State, Economy Consultant to the Prime Minister Tunisia for keynote speech. And our moderator is Mr. Turan Sert, the CEO of the Evrato, Turkey. And panelists, and panelists are Yevgeny Mitkov, CEO, Coin Army, USA, and Mr. Turgay Deniz, the president, Turkish Cypriot Chamber of Commerce, Turkish Republic Northern Cyprus, Mr. Kerem Çatay, the CEO, Ayapım Film Production Company, Turkey, Mr. Ali El Mualla, Assistant Secretary General of the Gulf Organization for Industrial Consulting, Ms. Ekaterina Maisuradze, Chairperson, Chairperson, Georgia and Asia Africa, Chamber of Commerce, Georgia. Yes, stage is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you uh, for your uh, invitation. The presentation is in English, but uh, I speak uh, in Arabic. This is the special meeting with the idea of trade بالعملة المحلية تأثيرها على المؤسسات البنكية وتأثيرها على المؤسسات الاقتصادية في مجال التصدير وسيكون لنا من خلال العرض حديث عن أصل الفكرة فكرة التجارة بالعملة المحلية وكذلك التعرض ل موقف المصدرين والبنوك والتعرض لحالة تونس لا سيما في إطار إمضاء مذكرة التفاهم بين البنك المركزي التونسي والبنك المركزي الصيني من المؤكد أن تأثير الأزمة المالية العالمية التي مست مجموع الدول الصاعدة خاصة في آسيا جنوب شرق آسيا سنة 2008 هي التي أثرت بشكل كبير ودفعت إلى التوقي من تنامي مخاطر الصرف والارتباط بالعملات العالمية بالدولار باليورو اليان والليرة البريطانية خاصة فهذا التأثير السلبي دفع مجمل هذه الدول إلى اعتماد آلية جديدة أو مقاربة جديدة في التجارة الدولية خاصة التجارة البينية باعتماد الدفع بالعملة المحلية للتوقي من مخاطر الصرف وكذلك للتقليل من تقلبات العملات 
الدولار الأمريكي منذ عقود هيمنة على كعملة على تبادل التجاري العالمي فسنة 2014 مثل حوالي 51.9% من مجموع التجارة الدولية كما أن اليورو مثل 30.5% والليرة البريطانية 5.4% ثم تليها اليان الياباني واليوان الصيني الاتفاق الذي حصل ابتداء بين الصين وهونغ كونغ في تسوية المبادلات التجارية بالعملة المحلية حدث في جويلية 2009 هذا الاتفاق التعامل باليوان تقليص مخاطر الصرف والتقليل من مخاطر على التجارة وكذلك التقليل من كلفة المبادلات التجارية إضافة إلى تحقيق نجاعة عمل المؤسسات المالية فالدفع بالعملات هو قرار ذكي يتخذه المورد يتخذه المصدر للتحكم أكثر في المخاطر بوجود أسعار صرف أفضل وتخفيض الأسعار والارتباط بالعلامة التجارية إضافة إلى سرعة الدفع من التجارب كذلك التي انطلقت في ديسمبر 2017 هو الاتفاق الحاصل بين البنك الأندونيسي والماليزي والتايلندي في ديسمبر 2017 تم إمضاء مذكرة التفاهم بين الملوك المركزية وساهم هذا في الدخول في طور جديد في المبادلات البينية لا سيما وأن التجارة البينية الإقليمية سنة 2016 قد بلغت 521 مليار دولار أي حوالي 23.5% من حجم التبادل التجاري لهذه الدول وارتفعت الاستثمارات الخارجية المباشرة البينية بمجموعة لاسيان إلى مستوى قياسي ببلوغ 24 مليار دولار في سنة 2016 أي حوالي 25% من إجمالي تدفقات الاستثمار الأجنبي المباشر نفس الشيء حصل في الاتفاق بين تركيا وروسيا وإيران الذين أمضوا اتفاقا يقضي باستخدام العملات المحلية في التجارة البينية في البترول والغاز والمنتجات الأساسية ونفس الشيء بين تايلندا واليابان وإذا أخذنا هذه الأمثلة نجد أن هذه البلدان سعت للتحكم أكثر في المخاطر ولكن كيف وما هو رأي البنوك وكذلك رأي المؤسسات التي الاقتصادية التي تمول الأنشطة التجارية فالبنوك ترغب في تقديم أفضل المنتوجات والخدمات لحرثائها وتقديم عروض تنافسية وناجعة البنوك تحذر من تعدد التعامل بعملات مختلفة بما يرفع من المخاطر وهي تتوقع بالترفيع من الكلفة وهي تخير التعامل مع مؤسسات محددة تمكنها من التحكم في المخاطر وبالتالي تدعيم أو فهي فالبنوك تدعم التعامل المتشابك أو المعاملة التحفيزية التي تسعى للتركيز عليها وعديد البنوك والمؤسسات الاقتصادية أصبحت تمركز أنشطتها في بعض المحاور والمراكز الحيوية مثل سنغافورة وبريطانيا وإيرلندا للتحكم في النفقات والكلفة والبحث عن النجاعة والمردودية وهذا ما يفسر تنامي التدفقات المالية من خلال المركز المالي البريطاني مثلا ويمكن التوقي من مخاطر التبادل والسواب من خلال مركز النشاط بهذه المراكز المالية ومن جانب المؤسسات الاقتصادية فإن اختيار المؤسسة لعملة الفوترة والخلاص للصادرات يمكن أن يتم عن طريق الفوترة بعملة المنتج أو اختيار الفوترة بالعملة المحلية وهناك جملة من العوامل والحوافز 
التي تساعد على اتخاذ القرار لاختيار عملة الخلاص ومن بينها التدخل السياسي لاعتماد عملة معينة مثل الصين التي تعدد الاتفاقيات التعامل بطريقة السواب وقد أمضت إلى حد الآن حوالي 36 اتفاقية فيها المغرب، تونس، تركيا وعديد البلدان الأخرى كذلك من العوامل المحددة هي العلاقات التاريخية والثقافية فإذا أخذنا مثال تونس العلاقات التاريخية المرتبطة بالاستعمار اعتماد الفرنك الفرنسي ثم اليورو على حساب الدولار كذلك عوامل أخرى يمكن أن نسوقها تساعد على اتخاذ القرار وهي العوامل الجغرافية والجهوية والإقليمية مثل اعتماد اليوان في الصين اليوان الصيني في آسيا المحيط الهادي كذلك عوامل اقتصادية مثل تسعير النفط بالدولار وعوامل تجارية مثل الحوافز التي تعطى لتغطية مخاطر عملة معينة بتمكين المشترين من تخفيضات من المزودين إذا أخذنا الحالة التونسية نجد أن تونس تتعامل تجاريا مع 172 بلد الحاصل التجاري أو العجز التجاري المسجل مع جملة هذه البلدان يرتفع إلى 11.6 بليون دينار أي حوالي 4 بليون دولار هناك ثلاثة دول في تعامل التجاري التونسي معها سجلت لوحدها ستة حوالي ستة بليون دينار أي تقريبا نصف العجز التجاري المسجل وهي بالأساس الصين بتسجيل عجز بواحد بليون دولار وتركيا بتسجيل عجز بحوالي نصف بليون دولار وكذلك روسيا بتسجيل عجز بحوالي نصف بليون دولار هذا ما دفع البنك المركزي التونسي إلى التفاوض مع البنك المركزي الصيني بحكم أن الصين هي أكبر بلد وأكبر عجز مسجل في تونس هو مع الصين الشعبية فتم في ديسمبر 2016 إمضاء مذكرة تفاهم بين البنك المركزي التونسي والبنك المركزي الصيني من أجل دعم التعاون المصري في بين البلدين ولكن خاصة في مجال مذكرة التفاهم للتبادل التجاري بالعملات المحلية وهذا يساعد يساعد على خفض مخاطر التبادل التجاري تنمية الصادرات التونسية باتجاه الصين وتم من خلال هذا الاتفاق قبول الدينار كضمان وبالتالي تحول العملة التونسية المحلية إلى وسيلة إلى وسيلة دفع تساعد على التقليص من العجز المسجل خاصة مع الصين ونعتقد أن تنامي العجز بين تونس والصين يمكن أن يتم تقليصه من جهة باعتماد العملة المحلية في التبادل التجاري وكذلك بدعم الاستثمارات الخارجية المباشرة ودعم كذلك الصادرات التونسية باتجاه الصين وهذا النموذج الذي تفاوضت حوله تونس مع الصين يمكن أن يشمل كذلك بقية البلدان التي تعاني يعاني الميزان التجاري التونسي عجزا متفاقما معها مثل تركيا فيمكن تطبيق هذا النموذج مع الدولة التركية وقبل أيام صار حديث بيني وبين محافظ بنك المركز التونسي وكان أكد لي بأن هذا هو توجه الحكومة التونسية وتوجه البنك المركزي التونسي في التفاوض مع البلدان الشريكة والبلدان التي لنا تعامل تجاري كبير معها في اعتماد هذه المقاربة في الدفع بالعملة المحلية وهذا يساعد على وضع خطوط تمويل لتنمية التجارة البينية وتأتي أهمية الاتفاقيات الثنائية وكذلك متعددة الأطراف على المستوى الجهوي التي تؤسس لنظام جديد للتبادل التجاري بين البلدان 
الصاعدة على غرار ما حصل بين بلدان جنوب شرق آسيا يمكن أن يحصل كذلك بين البلدان الصاعدة في منطقة جنوب المتوسط وكذلك بينها وبين بقية البلدان في جنوب شرق آسيا بما يساعد على دعم تحرير التجارة الدولية لتكون أكثر تكافؤا وأكثر عدلا هذه النقاط التي أردت أن أسوقها في هذه المداخلة أشكركم على حسن الانتباه والسلام عليكم Thank you, Mr. Saidi, uh, for this eye-opening talk. Uh, dear guests, thank you for spending time here uh, to listen to us uh, and our distinguished panelists here we are on trade with local currency from the perspective of bankers and exporters. I mean, uh, w when, you, when you look at the, uh, you know, the, I mean, uh, Mr. Saidi uh, has given us a brief overview of what's going on around the world, but, you know, starting with the 1990s, when the globalization is like in full wind all around the world, um, there is this idea of like a single currency where the whole economic activity revolves around, and the U.S. dollar at that time was one of the forefronts of that single currency, and with, um, you know, uh, as, uh, as the globalization uh, becomes more like a pre prevalent uh, uh, issue in all around the world and the trade, trade and economy has uh, developed, US dollar and euro has become the sort of the uh, area, uh, the, the, the currency, the medium of exchange uh, among countries uh, to, uh, to you know, facilitate the trade between themselves. Now, um, when you look at it from the, uh, you know, the economic perspective, actually using that currency of like, not your own local currency, but using the currency of another state like, you know, US dollar or euro is essentially uh, providing free credit to those, uh, to, to those states that uh, issue those uh, currencies. So it is, uh, in that sense, actually providing free money to those countries. So, but why was not why was it was not possible to uh, have bilateral agreements so that you can use your own local currency? Uh, there are like obviously a couple of reasons for that. Uh, some part of it is political. Some part of it is also technological because it's easy to use. Uh, uh, as you know, a single currency all around your trade versus using local currencies like with each uh, country. But you know, there has been developments that has been going on both on the political area and the technological area that we will discuss uh, with our panelists. But uh, recently, with the latest trend going into uh, the uh, more, uh, especially on the Western front uh, with the US, the, the more protectionism uh, from uh, and more like emphasize on security is sort of uh, actually uh, resulted in countries talking more and more about bilateral trades and like trades uh, doing, having trades in their own current, uh, uh, in their local currency. Now, uh, first of all, we're going to look at um, uh, from a state perspective uh, and uh, talk with, uh, we will hear from uh, Ms. Ekaterina Maeseratze on the Georgians' uh, perspective about how Georgia sees itself in terms of the uh, trade relations between Georgia and the rest of the world. And then we'll talk to the uh, other uh, uh, speakers after all. Please welcome uh, Ms. Ekaterina Maeseratze. Dear guests, honorable mem members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, it's great honor for me to be addressing you today and see so many po powerful people uh, in attendance. The most important aspect of the economic development of any uh, country is the establishment of a business-friendly environment. This summit uh, serves as a great mission and opens the doors 
to new opportunities for various countries, including Georgia and Turkey. These two countries having experience of friendly relations are being united under the One Belt, One Road initiative that gives magnificent possibilities to all the member states for prospective business growth. To start off, we are a small country with rich history serving as a natural bridge between East and the West. Georgia is a newly emerged market striving to become an integral part of the global economy, more diversified and better integrated in international markets. Our government's top priority is to develop the most business-friendly framework that one can offer. We are number six, according uh, to uh, easy of doing business in the world, to continue IMF forecasts that Georgia will be leader in terms of economic growth in the region. We are 16th freest economy according to Heritage Foundation and are number five in transparency at Open Budget Index. Georgia is the only country in the region with free trade agreements, both with China as well as the European Union. Furthermore, we have free trade regime with EFTA, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Ireland, the CIS countries, Turkey and Hong Kong, which significantly increase the country's export and investment potential allowing companies in Georgia to get duty-free access to the market of 2.3 billion people. FTA frameworks are crucially important and beneficial for exporting Georgian national products, such as wine, nuts, uh, water, soft drinks, fruits, honey, and etc. Under the uh, terms of the deep and the comprehensive tree trade area agreement with the European Union, it is possible for investors to build enterprises in Georgia and produce products in Georgia without any customs duty on the EU market. After launching a free trade agreement with China, European, Asian, and American, investors are able to establish their businesses in Georgia and enter the China's West market through the Georgia FTA regulations. Due to this two free trade agreement, Georgia has already become the subject of multilateral interest, besides the fact that European and Chinese have access to free uh, markets throughout uh, Georgia. Georgia benefits from this taxation process, particularly thanks to the uh, taxes that investors will pay in Georgia. One of the most essential advantages is that the precedent of powerful production of competitive uh, export products in Georgia will emerge. That is the reason for founding GAACC. Briefly, I would like to introduce Georgian Asian African Chamber of Commerce, which was established as a platform and medium for connecting interesting business owners from around the globe and get them engaged into Georgia market and vice versa. The idea of founding Georgia and Asia Africa Chamber of Commerce, which support developing businesses between Georgia and countries of Asia and Africa, was born and uh, nourished in Georgia, the country where the Eastern culture and traditions meet the Western principles and contemporary values. I believe in Georgia is a potentially successful country for further flourishing and economic development. It's a land of limitless possibilities and investment opportunities. Here with, as it uh, as, uh, accepted worldwide, Georgia always used to play a key role on the Silk Road and was actively involved in the trade. 
GDP of Georgia was estimated at 39.3 billion US dollars. Last year and the growth index is quite steady and promising. As well as that, I must be noted that all the credit for establishing the business friendly environment for investors in our country goes to the government of Georgia. Thanks for your attention and wish all of you a very productive day and efficient networking opportunities. I'm looking forward to see you in Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Maisuradze, uh, for, for, this, for the speech. And, uh, uh, we, ha we have heard from Tunisia and uh, from Georgia, uh, but mostly from the uh, government officials uh, on uh, what uh, they uh, see and how they see the, those bilateral agreements. But what do, what do exporters think about that? How they approach it? What's their perspective? Let's hear from Mr. Turgay Deniz, the president of Turkish Cypriot uh, Chamber of Commerce, on what the, what the exporters think about it. Mr. Deniz, yeah. stage Thank is yours. You. Değerli konuklar, hanımefendiler, beyefendiler. Kıbrıs Türk Ticaret Odası Başkanı olarak sizleri şahsım ve Kuzey Kıbrıs'ın iklimi gibi sıcak insanları adına sevgi ve saygılarla selamlıyorum. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk halkı bugüne kadar adadaki çözüm çabalarına hep destek vermiştir. Ancak bunun karşılığında uluslararası arenadan gerekli desteği hiç ama hiç görmemiştir. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk halkı daha önceleri vermiş olduğu varoluş mücadelesinde çok başarılı olmuştur. Bugünlerde ise ekonomik kalkınma mücadelesi vermektedir. Tek destekçimiz bu mücadelemizi verirken tek destekçimiz ana vatanımız Türkiye olmuştur. Ve olmaya da devam etmektedir. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin en büyük sivil toplum örgütü olan Kıbrıs Türk Ticaret Odası'nın 9. Boğaziçi Zirvesi'nde temsil edilmiş olmasından ve ana vatanımızda bulunmaktan duyduğum onuru ve kıvancı sizlerle paylaşmak istiyorum. Değerli konuklar, Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti ile ilgili önce rakamlara bir göz atalım. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin toplam ithalatı 1.8 milyar dolardır. Toplam ithalat içerisinde Türkiye ile yapılan ithalat 1 milyar 04 milyar e, dolardır. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti ithalatının yüzde 58'ini Türkiye'den yapmaktadır. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin toplam ihracatı ise sadece 101 milyon Amerikan dolarıdır. Toplam ihracat içerisinde Türkiye'ye yapılan ihracat rakamı 64 milyon dolardır. Dolayısıyla Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti ihracatının yüzde 64'ünü Türkiye'ye yapıyor. Türkiye'ye yapılan ihracatın Türkiye'den yapılan ithalatı karşılama oranı yüzde altı buçuk. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin Türkiye'ye karşı oldukça ciddi oranda dış ticaret açığı mevcuttur. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin resmi para birimi Türk lirası. Ancak Türk lirasının istikrarsızlığı nedeniyle dahili ticarette çoklu para birimi ile işlem yapılmaktadır. Ağırlıklı olarak gayrimenkul isterlin ile, İngiliz poundu ile, Oto sektörü euro ile, üniversite harçları ise dolar ile işlem yapmaktadır. Türkiye'den yapılan ithalatın yüzde 60-65 civarı döviz ile yani dolar veya euro ile yapılmaktadır. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin Türkiye ile yüzde yüz Türk parası ile 
ticaret yapmaması Panama'nın Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nden Euro ile işlem yapması gibi anormal durumu yansıtıyor. Bunun en önemli nedeni Türk parasının dolar ve euro gibi istikrarlı olmamasından ve Türkiye'deki ithalatçı firmaların pardon ihracatçı firmaların geleneksel olarak rezerv para özelliği olan para mı birimi ile işlem yapmak alışkanlıklarından politikalarından kaynaklanmaktadır. Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti Türkiye arası dış ticaret önemli oranda Türkiye lehine olduğundan her iki ekonominin de Türk lirası ekonomilere sahip olması nedeniyle rezerv para fonksiyonu Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti Türkiye Cumhuriyeti arasında belirleyici faktör değildir ve olmamalıdır. Türk lirasının görece istikrarlı olduğu 2014-2017 yılları arası Türk lirası ile ithalat tutarında ciddi artış olmuştur. Türkiye'den yapılan ithalatın, Türkiye'ye yapılan ihracatın 16 katından fazla olması ile birlikte her iki ekonomide Türk lirası kullanılıyor olması, Türk lirası ile ticaret yapılması için en güçlü zemini oluşturmaktadır. Ekonomi teorisi herhangi iki ekonomide parasal birlik içinde olursa karşılıklı ticaret hacimlerinin artacağını öngörmektedir. Türkiye'den Türk lirası ile ticaret yapılması Türkiye'den daha fazla ithalat yapılmasına yol açacaktır. Türk lirası ile işlem yapılması Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin Türkiye'ye daha fazla ihracat yapmasına da yol açacaktır. Ancak Türk lirası ile ithalat yapılmasının en önemli etkisi işlem maliyetlerinin daha düşük olmasına, kur riskinin ortadan kalkmasına, bu sayede fiyatlar üzerinden işlem maliyeti ve kur riski marjının sıfırlanması ile fiyat düzeyinde görece iyileşme sağlanması görülecektir. Özellikle her iki ekonominin Türk lirası ekonomileri olduğu dikkate alındığında olması gereken iki ekonomi arasında euro ve dolar gibi para birimleriyle değil Türk lirası ile işlem yapılmasıdır. Dolar ve euro ile işlem yaparak Amerika ve Avrupa ekonomilerine gereksiz şekilde senyoraj ödenmektedir. Sözlerime burada son verirken zirvenin ana temasına uygun olarak dünya barışı ile ekonomik kalkınların kalkınmanın tüm insanlar için sağlanması en büyük arzumuzdur. Beni sabırla dinlediğiniz için teşekkür eder, saygılar sunarım. Thank you, Mr. Deniz. Now, so far in our speeches, we have, you know, looked at it from the political perspective and the trade perspective, from the exporters' perspective, and uh, we looked at the current state. And with the emergence of, as we said, uh, the political changes in the world, there has been more and more talk of those bilateral trades and. Uh, even some different uh, areas, different uh, opportunities that would come with, with uh, uh, countries uh, trading with each other. Now, the, there is this, uh, as I said, there's this political part, there's this uh, exporters part, but there's also the technological part. And there is this present state and there is the future state, which is uh, future brings us all, you know, excitement and uh, hope and uh, what does what does future bring to us? When you look at currently uh, in the international trade, the hot topic for future is the uh, countries using their own currency, digitalize their own currency, and use that currency in their trades and use that currency not in bilateral trades, but use their currency 
also in, with different countries and which, which would allow them to actually uh, manage and use their, optimize their uh, current trade deficit. With that, I would like to give the uh, word to Mr. Uh, Evgeny Mitko, who's going to talk us about the digitalization of the uh, uh, uh, government, uh, you know, local currencies. How can we do that? What are the risks? What can we do about it? How can we look at the future? Thank you. Imagine these days you can take a container from Shanghai and ship it to Europe in 14 days. But to pay for that container takes 30 days on average. Quite, Im quite amazing feat for 21st century. Part of the problem with current payments has been this um, sort of centralization around the dollar and uh, to a lesser extent euro. The entire international payment system basically operates um, swift in uh, dollars. And as a result, anybody from Germany or from Turkey looking to pay for a container in China first needs to buy dollars, wait for the settlement of that transaction. Once that transaction settles, send the money over the international uh, SWIFT network. That money gets received several days later, several business days later in the other country. And then there's another settlement cycle between dollar and the local currency. So pretty much international trade globally relies on this double currency transaction, local currency to dollar, dollar to another local currency to make an international payment. And of course, as we see, that takes time. So if you're an importer or an exporter, of course it's very convenient to stay and keep your prices in dollars, then you eliminate the currency risk of anything changing if your money is going to be in transit for 30 days, God forbid. If all of a sudden payments start happening not in 30 days, but in 15 seconds, you don't have currency risk per se. And you don't care in what, in what currency you're making that payment if there's no currency risk, because 14 seconds for all intensive purposes is pretty comfortable time frame in the currency markets, even for emerging market currencies. There's another big development that countries usually spe uh, are specialized in a particular field, in particular manufacturing or uh, industry. And as a result, invariably run deficits. They take Turkey, for example. It imports $23 billion worth of goods, mainly componentry from China, but exports only three billion to China. Very unbalanced trade. $20 billion. $20 billion deficit in the trade with China. So if the two central banks got together and signed a bilateral swap agreement as the current practice calls for, that bilateral agreement would only address $3 billion worth of trade, and that's it, and one-seventh of the whole amount. So clearly not a, a very working solution for specialized countries that have massive deficits in, in one direction, but massive surpluses in another. So if you look at Turkey, it has massive surplus with Africa, with majority of Europe, and um, majority of CIS countries. So what solution do you uh, bring about? Um, of course, the current solution is dollars. Uh, if everybody pays each other with dollars, effectively the dollar has been this trade balance deficit equalizer. If everybody has dollars, they don't have to equalize their trade between each other. As long as you have dollars, you, you pay or you get paid. However, if you want to work in local currency, clearly, especially in uh, channels like Turkey, China, it's very difficult to uh, implement uh, a local currency swap between Turkish lira and Chinese renminbi, uh, given such a huge disparity in the trade balance. The real answer to that, and thank God to new technology, 
is to create a digital currency of the national currency. When you digitalize the national currency, you effectively create a central liquidity point for the currency for all players around the world. Effectively, anybody that needs Turkish lira in this particular example, whether that's Chinese, Russian, African, European, or American trading partners, all of them start trading in the same trading pool. And the budget, uh, the, the trading deficit that exists between China and Turkey melts away in the surplus that exists in Africa, Europe, and America. So effectively, by digitalizing the local currency and turning it on a blockchain, which is one of the most, um, um, most interesting technologies to use these days for that, uh, and I'll go into that in a second, um, effectively create a single pool of liquidity for all trading partners to trade with each other and pay local businesses with the na uh, native currency. Eliminating risk, and especially if you do that in a matter of seconds, not days, there's no currency risk for the importer or the exporter for that matter. I mentioned uh, the word blockchain, and uh, it would be uh, difficult to um, leave the crowd with just that. Blockchain obviously evolved from the um, Bitcoin currency, that was the background of that currency, and uh, has given incredible promise for development of payments globally. At this point, a number of industries are already running blockchain initiatives, whether that's in energy, whether that's in healthcare, whether that's in um, supply chain management, logistics. All of these industries are being revolutionized with blockchain technology. Payments is also a very hot uh, place where blockchain technology would leave its mark and replace the existing um, centralized systems into a decentralized, um, effectively real-time global payment system enabling every country to stay with its local currency but freely trade with their trading partners regardless of trading balances or not. How, how would that work? By digitizing each currency, for example, there's a similar initiative in the Black Sea Basin, um, the liquidity pulls together and the whether that's privately initiated or central bank initiated, um, the balances that flow between the countries balance each other out a lot more easily than if it's on a bilateral basis. The key with blockchain is it enables multilateral trading within a sin uh, single trading technology. So what a lot of people have been dreaming about but never been able to execute is increasingly becoming a reality with blockchain technology, which, uh, thank God, uh, came about at the right opportune time. But um, let me ask you a question. You mentioned that, you know, you, I think what you're proposing or what you uh, elaborate in this uh, speech is countries each having their own national currency to be digitalized and uh, having those liquidity pools that with those trading pools, different countries can, uh, you know, uh, use and exchange those currencies, as you said in Turkish example, an African country and uh, China can use that to... Mm -hmm. to uh, going back to, you know, the history of the, you know, the, the economic development, sort of like US dollar trying to become a global reserve currency rather than having those things, uh, those uh, local currencies. Uh, with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is more like uh, as, a, as the uh, first use case, real use case of blockchain technology, having a more peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it. Mm -hmm. There are obviously, uh, I mean, let's not talk about the other blockchain in other areas, but let's just focus on the payments issue. There's this Bitcoin where, where it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but there are also some other cryptocurrencies that are like Bitcoin but uh, focuses more on the uh, international transactions and those aspire, aspire to be the global reserve currency, such as Ripple, for example. Mm -hmm. 
What's your take on that? I think um, anything that tries to centralize payments will have serious challenges mm -hmm. at, at this point. First of all, when you go to the local uh, market, whether that's Kapolich or Shi or something um, similar, people don't think in Ripple terms. People don't think even in Bitcoin terms. It is very difficult to change the um, national psyche to think in those terms. So I think they'll have a very serious challenge. Um, there was obviously from the uh, international institutions, the SDU and mm -hmm. uh, various other initiatives to um, create such global currencies. It is very difficult to uh, pull that off and have them accept it on a local basis. So you basically uh, think it's the mindset of the institutions that will probably prevent such a, a global currency to be successful. In and, and, and from the local populations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just can't go buy a bag of tomatoes with Ripple. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the real problem is assigning value, right? Um, and that's where Bitcoin also has struggled significantly, not to mention its volatility. Um, when you work for the day and let's say you earn in the US $100 mm -hmm. or in Turkey you earn um, 300 lira mm -hmm. or 500 lira. You have a certain value of how much your labor is worth mm -hmm. and you compare that value against what you're about to buy at the farm stand, at the meat shop, at the fish stand and so forth. So naturally you have this in your, uh, in your mind a correlation between the local currency and your labor, which is imprinted in people's mm -hmm. minds. So it's very difficult to change that to something else externally, unless obviously the local currency crashes and burns and doesn't exist anymore, like maybe the case of Zimbabwe. Um, so the, that's the, the real challenge. The way um, I think the world will very easily proceed in adopting the technology but keeping the national currencies which obviously gives the uh, country uh, a lot of control still over the monetary policy mm -hmm. um, which also is a very important aspect of this. By staying with local currencies countries can adapt monetary policy, uh, be flexible in a global world and be able to adjust while still having very real-time connection to payments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Kuhl. Now, uh, at this part of the uh, discussion, I would like to ask the audience if you have any questions to our panelists. I don't see. Up. Oh. Please. Um. Our esteemed speakers. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Questions. Do you really think that the, the U.S. would allow an alternate currency like the crypto or whatever, digital currency? Like Ripple, for example. Whatever, whatever. I, I think the, for the U.S. of America, financial control of the world money market is a top priority, and that cannot be jeopardized by any other currency, whether it is real, or world, or traditional, or whether it is digital. I don't have any hopes for any currency to become seriously the global alternative to the, to the dollar unless that is negotiated at the table between the US and who, uh, who other, whatever other nation, and I mean China. There has to be an accord with the US for any kind of currency to be used. That's a personal opinion, and I think uh, this is a, a good for games, for the fun of it, that you have digital currency in a digital age, but that's one thing. The, the god of the digital age, which is the US of America, will not tolerate. It, it's a very fair point. Uh, I'm not actually saying that we need to replace the dollar uh, or the systems of the dollar with um, some digital currency. Just the contrary, 
the dollar will continue to be probably a very strong and um, means of uh, exchange between countries. What I'm suggesting is the local currency just becomes a bigger part of that. So effectively, the local currency is not replacing the dollar. It's just taking a percentage of the transactions in international trade. And if, if more and more of those countries happen to do that, which, by the way, it's already happening, um, again, with these bilateral agreements, uh, you would uh, effectively digitizing the national currency puts a turbo bo boost on a bilateral agreement. And what's more importantly, you don't need either the banking system or the uh, central banks for such um, arrangements to exist. These are done entirely on a private basis, uh, on private exchanges. So is, this can work, I'm not saying that it will take over the entire payment system, but it already is happening as we speak. Uh, you can make a Bitcoin payment for your Chinese uh, purchase any day of the week, um, and, and that happens already. So there is already a number of cryptocurrencies being used in international trade. By digitalizing a local currency, whether it's digital Turkish lira or digital um, Ukrainian hverna or ruble or Chinese renminbi, you effectively allow small and medium-sized businesses to participate with that. There's a big challenge also with these uh, bilateral swap agreements. They're usually for the benefit of large multinationals. Uh, it's very difficult for a small business to go to the central bank and ask to get the foreign currency at the rate that the central bank has agreed with the other central bank. So effectively, having digitalization serves small and medium-sized businesses, which by no means at the moment are very big active participants in international trade. So all of this could actually be an additional trade, an additional benefit for the global economy on top of what already exists. Uh, it'll be difficult to renegotiate current agreements, but any new business, that a small business buying a pallet from China, a uh, medium-sized business buying a shipload uh, from the Gulf, those kind of transactions you'd start seeing happening in local currency uh, in uh, real-time form. So essentially it's not like a one global currency we are talking about here with the digitalization, but it's more like those local ones sort of becoming like small hubs all around the world. Exactly. Potentially being a bit competitive to US dollar in terms of the trade uh, means, but not Necessarily replacing meaning it. replacing it. It's just being like the little brother, little sister all around rather than having one single party. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Goes through the clearance, goes through the central clearance house in Washington. That's so correct. So if I transfer $10,000, from the back here to the bank next door, it doesn't go straight, it goes through, through Washington to control the money movement of the, the IMM, the money market of the world. This is easy to talk about. The US is watching this and is using this currency for certain reasons which I don't want to discuss, but they will not tolerate it to become any part of, of global money market. We will see if, you know, how it will, it will continue. Another question back there. Uh, we have two questions, one here and one here. So. Uh, merhaba, ben Sevda Aydın. Şimdi e, digitalizasyon e, geçmemizde e, ben şöyle bir korku seziniyorum. Dijitale geç, geçmeyen kurumlar e, çağ ayak uyduramaz deniliyor. Evet, buna geçtiğimiz zaman bu e, blockchain ödeme sistemine de geçtiğimiz zaman tamamen bir e, aslında bakarsanız bana göre Amerikan US dolara karşı yapılan bir merkez para birimi. Merkez para birimi de sonra ulusal ülkelerin yönetiminden merkez yönetimine geçiyor ve sonra da biz e, maalesef e, yine yönetiliyoruz e, ve bence etik olmayan burada şu insanların karar dışında kararlar alınıyor. Bunu üst düzey e, yine e, 
nasıl söyleyeyim e, pa para birim güçleri ya da işte emperyalizm yön veriyor. Bence hepsi bir kurgu. Hepsi yine aynı merkez. Aynı kişiler yönetiliyor. Hazırlığı da çok önce yapılmış. Çok tehlikeli buluyorum. Yarın çipleneceğiz deniliyor. E, özgürlüğümüz tamamen elimizden gidiyor ve ulusal e, milletleri de mültecilerle karıştırıp çok farklı bir böl e, küçült yönet felsefesi var vesaire. E, bunu tekrar bir bence referandum yapılıyor ya bunu referanduma koymak lazım. Bence herkes ulusal devletini koruması lazım ve ad adil olmayan da bir şey var. O da e, gelişmiş ülkelerinden gelişmemiş ülkeleri e, her zaman bu sistemde baskı altına ve yönetim altına almış oluyorlar. Yine aynı tas, yine aynı hamam devam ediyor ve bizim hiçbir zaman gelişmemiz mümkün olmayacak. Teşekkür ederim benim görüşüm. E, panelistlerimizden bir cevap bekliyor musunuz bununla ilgili yoksa görüşünüzü mü aktardınız? Um, Do you have any comments I, on the... I'll, I'll make a quick comment. I think blockchain actually enables the ability to um, give more local power and actually local small economies to be more uh, active participants by effectively. In fact, that's what the, the whole notion behind blockchain is, to be a distributed equal ledger with everybody voting in consensus on the transactions. So effectively, um, whether that's international trade, payments, uh, or currency markets, or um, import-export, uh, blockchain will give significant power to local players uh, not seen in the last 50 or 60 years. I would it's, like a to matter, it's a matter of actually them taking that uh, and running with it, as opposed to, again, letting some central hub run it for them. Uh, also, let me add a couple of words, uh, a couple of sentences on that. Um, the whole idea, I mean, we are talking about blockchain, but the, as I said, the first real use case of blockchain was Bitcoin, which, which started in 2009. And the whole idea of Bitcoin started, uh, has started at that time is the 2008 financial crisis in the United States, and the United States Treasury uh, printing enormous amounts of money to prevent a financial crisis, but people understanding that the governments have the power to print as much money as they would like, which resulted in inflation, which essentially means your money in your pocket devaluing. So this is essentially the origins of this whole notion of blockchain and by Bitcoin is the idea of people trying to prevent their freedom. Back to actually uh, the gentleman's comments about US knows every transaction where you send money. That's true for US dollar transactions, but that's not true for Bitcoin. You can send money from one country to another, to anyone in the world in seconds, and that person can get that money and can use it in 10, 20, 30 minutes. So yes, you can argue that with the whole uh, digitalization, it's the, you know, the existing powers trying to keep the control, but Bitcoin, two people, not necessarily states, but two people give some breathing space at this moment. And the main aspect of Bitcoin is the censorship resistance, which is very key at the moment. That's a very powerful point that um, with blockchain, you don't need a central power to allow the transactions to happen. So effectively, if a country decides to provide liquidity in local digital Turkish lira, nobody can stop it. Turkey can print as many digital Turkish liras as they like. And if on the other side, China is also printing digital RMB, and there is an exchange that takes both of those, who cares what the uh, American dollar does or, not, or doesn't do? It's on a blockchain and it's on a network that is very difficult to control. In fact, I'll give you a fact. Um, part of what developed blockchain and Bitcoin was a 2003 desire by, by, by the Pentagon in the US after seeing that Napster was extremely successful as a media distribution um, platform. The entire US 
Hollywood and music industry wanted to shut down Napster and they couldn't. And the Pentagon was very much amused by that, that here's a, in, such a powerful industry wanting to kill this invention and they couldn't. People continue to share illegally music regardless of the desires of these billion dollar industries. And that's when the Pentagon decided that maybe it's time for us to create a distributed network that takes advantage of such technology. Little did they knew that they were, that was actually the basis for Bitcoin's creation. So this distributed nature allows for really, I mean, distributing the platform on millions of computers allows for some serious democratization of the system, which really prevents central control. Thank you. I think we have one more question here. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion. I just had a comment and a question. One is about the role of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Certainly blockchain has an opportunity to uh, provide a new mechanism for facilitating transactions without going through a central network between parties. Uh, but uh, cryptocurrencies themselves, the idea that cryptocurrencies came about because, for example, after the 2008 financial freeze, uh, certainly the central banks in the United States and Europe had very loose monetary policies and certainly in the United States were buying up a lot of assets. Uh, but that didn't lead to inflation. The attempt there was to avoid deflation and a worsening world recession because of the credit freeze. So there was no evidence at all that either the euro or the dollar uh, uh, prices were inflating. Indeed, they were uh, inflation in both zones were extremely low. And the experience with uh, Bitcoin, since it really had no inherent value, it's been, been basically a speculative item. And of course, it's experienced extremely high volatility. So I think it's important to separate Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency from blockchain, which is a technique for doing something. And and what I see missing in this discussion is the emphasis on instantaneous transactions. But what about contracts? How are you going to have contracts between parties for future payments that are not in a reserve currency? Uh, it's an excellent question. And uh, we, in fact, uh, through a couple of uh, engagements that I'm involved with, see that already as a serious demand. Uh, the uh, to address the first point in your uh, comment that um, printing fiat money uh, could be inflationary, could be deflationary, depending on how much bad credit you have in the system. The reality, though, is you, uh, the Federal Reserve in the States usually has printed money in crisis as a means of exporting the cr crisis to the trading partners. If you see throughout history, whether it's 1971 or 87 to 90, or uh, 2000 or 2008, the printing of, of dollars effectively allows the U.S. to export the crisis to whoever is the biggest trading partner at the time. Um, so it really has nothing to do with inflation or deflation. It's about exporting. The uh, ability to create smart contracts inside blockchain which already allows real-time payments is obviously an incredibly powerful feature. So again, in uh, international trade, which is so dependent uh, on contracts and at, at the moment letters of credit and bank guarantees, it would invariably flock to blockchain systems of trade simply because you have letters of credit and bank guarantees disappearing very fast as a result of Basel III the last bastion of um, letters of credit, uh, China, will probably stop issuing them on January 1st because Chinese banks will also be subject to the same rules that European and American banks have been subject to and as a result have stopped issuing them in very large numbers. So as the letters of credit um, business sort of winds down, blockchain and smart contracts will have to take up that baton very quickly and naturally if local currencies are also existent in digital form 
I think you would see that um, trade very quickly evolving in local digital currencies with smart contracts attached to them on a, some sort of international logistical blockchain, which there's a ton of being developed at the moment. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but uh, do you have one last, I think you would like to add a comment and then we'll have to finish. Yes, I just wanted to reply to the idea that the uh, loose credit uh, after 2008 was exporting uh, U.S. financial problems to the rest of the world. Uh, for example, AIG was a major insurer, and part of the problem of the 2008 financial crisis were a lot of, uh, of uh, assets that were being sold that were based on real estate. And these derivatives were sold to many banks around the world, including many German banks. And the insurer, AIG, was insuring these derivatives. Now, AIG quickly became bankrupt uh, except for the fact that the United States bailed them out in order so that they could honor their obligations to the German banks. So there was an effort by the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve to keep the entire world banking system from going under. And it wasn't exporting uh, U.S. problems to the rest of the world. It was trying to keep the entire world monetary and, and banking system from having, uh, making the world recession much worse than it would have otherwise been. No, that, that's correct. Uh, that, that part indeed saves the financial system, but p perhaps if you stop at that, then it would have been saving the world. But if you start then buying treasury bonds or start buying auto loans or student loans to the tune of $3 trillion, then it becomes a little bit of printing money. Uh, I would like to thank our dist distinguished speakers. Uh, for uh, being with us here. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for listening to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. We would like to present other awards for you. I would like to invite Mr. Er Erol Usar, the member of the ICP Executive Board, to present the honor awards. Evet. Fotoğraf çekeceksiniz değil mi? Tamam. Toplu olarak. <gülüyor>